the basic thesis or premise of my talk is, is that the development of liquefied natural gas facilities in British Columbia is going to move forward if for the only reason that politicians of both stripes in this province have already spent the money in their minds. And what I look upon something like this is, is an opportunity to try and do it as in the most practical way. And trying to reduce uh, carbon emissions as much as possible or trying to secure a maximum economic value to the province of British Columbia. I'm not an economist and hopefully there's some economists in the room because a lot of what I say borders on their field and certainly not the legal field. In terms of sh liquid natural gas production in the province of British Columbia, what you need firstly is you need some gas. Historically, we've produced about 3 billion cubic feet per day of gas in British Columbia from what's called conventional reserves. There are four major shale basins in British Columbia, as evidenced on this map. You have the Liard Basin, the Horn River Basin, the Cordova Embayment, and the Montanay. Each of those has unique features in terms of development. It's expected that the Montanay field will probably be producing the most amount of gas the soonest. And the reason for that is when, liquid na when natural gas is produced in shale formations, there's a difference between called what's called wet gas and dry gas. Wet natural gas has sometimes oil and it also has ethane, butane, propane, or the ains as I call them. And as we move later on into some of the slides, you'll see that the price of natural gas relative to the price of oil is completely disconnected at this point in time. And that's a very important part of this discussion. In terms of producing the natural gas, when the natural gas comes out of the ground from these shale formations, it requires fracturing or fracking. And we're not going to get into much detail about that and the environmental problems associated with it. But in certain, when it comes out of the ground, say for example in the Horn River Basin, 10% what comes out of the ground is CO2. And that CO2 is not currently counted in terms of the province's guidelines for CO2 emissions. There's also natural gas that escapes in the process. Since natural gas is essentially methane, it has a much higher greenhouse gas detrimental factor, if you want to call it, than CO2 itself. So that's a problem. The Liard Basin, the Cordova and Bayment and Montanay, probably 2% of what comes out of the ground CO2. In order to produce natural gas, you need energy. Gas just doesn't come bubbling out of the ground or gushing out of the ground like it does in the Beverly Hillbillies, if you're old enough to remember that. That just doesn't happen. So what you need to do is the gas comes out of the ground and you need significant amounts of energy to push it through the pipes to the processing center. The processing center or gas plants will scrub the grass, gas. You need energy to do that. Then you need energy to move it through the pipeline. So if you just look in the, this far right-hand corner of the map, you can see that we've got the gas fields up in northeast BC, but we have to process the gas up there, gather and collect it up there, and then push it through pipelines to the coast. So there's a significant amount of energy required to move it to the coast. In terms of discussions about liquid natural gas, the emphasis always seems to be on the energy required to produce the gas on the coast or at the LNG facility. Processing natural gas into LNG is the best way to describe it is freezing and squeezing it. You have to compress it so that it turns into a liquid. If you think in terms of a ping pong ball, we're trying to get the volume of gas from a basketball size down to a ping pong ball size. That requires significant amounts of energy. So I'm standing up here talking about energy, energy, energy to produce energy, and that's precisely right. In terms of what the, this, the question there is, what type of energy do we use to produce this energy? Is it going to be renewable form of a renewable electricity, or is it going to be natural gas itself? Because say, for example, to push the natural gas to the processing plants, I can use compressors, or essentially fans, that are run on natural gas, or I can use electricity. In British Columbia, if I use electricity, given our large hydroelectric base and potential for renewables, I can also do the same job using renewable electricity. In the pipelines, I, can, I need, again, compression to push it down to the coast. 
I can use natural gas to do that job, or I can use electricity. Once I get it to the coast, if I'm looking at doing uh, the LNG facilities, I have a couple of choices there. I can use natural gas to freeze and squeeze. And the, who, anybody who's ever been to a remote cabin in British Columbia and has run across a propane fridge realizes that, yes, you can do cooling with something that inherently tell you, tells you is heat. So you can do it that way. The other thing you can do it was with electric motors. So if I'm doing it with electric motors, the question is where does the electricity come from to run those motors? Is it going to be renewable electricity or is it going to be electricity used, uh, generated using natural gas? The key thing about a natural gas generated electricity is 60% of the cost of generating, roughly 60% of the cost of generating electricity using natural gas is the price of natural gas. So we've, if you look at it from start to finish, we need an awful lot of energy. So the question is, where does the energy come from? Uh, my own view is, please use as much as renewable electricity as you possibly can for this process, because if you're going to use nothing but natural gas, then we are going to have very large increases in CO2 emissions in this province. To put this into perspective, and in the energy industry, everything always needs to be put into perspective because the units that are used, whether it's MMBTUs, gigajoules, or over on the electricity side, megawatt hours tend to uh, have put glaze in people's eyes. So you just have to break it down to the basics. So in terms of carbon emissions from two fairly significant size LNG facilities at Kitimat, in one small one, that would be the Shell LNG plant and the proposed Apache plant and a very much smaller one that the Heisler partnership with. The total amount of CO2 that would be emitted from the LNG facility back through the pipelines, back into the gas fields, making some assumptions that we don't know, need to go into would be 24 megatons a year. In terms of British Columbia's current uh, emissions, we're at about 66 and we're trying to get down to, I think it's about 45 by 2020. So all it would take is two significant size LNG plants plus a smaller one and we'll get 24 megatons of everything we do um, in terms of LNG production, pipeline compression and field compression is done with natural gas. And clearly for the purposes of getting our emissions down in British Columbia, that won't do it. In terms of carbon tax, the carbon tax is not payable, say for example, on the emissions that come, the CO2 emissions that come out of the Horn River field. So that 10% of that volume of gas that comes out, there's no carbon tax payable on that. There is no carbon tax payable on what's, what I previously described as fugitive emissions. So the methane that escapes in the production. The carbon tax applies when you burn natural gas in, in a combustion process. In addition to that, if you're using natural gas to produce natural gas, you have to think if you're the province of the reduction in royalties to the province. There are no royalties on gas used to produce natural gas. Say for example, if I take my field example and I talk about, and I've, I've tried to explain that it's, I can use natural gas for electricity, if I'm using natural gas to produce elect, uh, natural gas in the field, there's no royalty payable on that. It's not clear whether that extends to natural gas used for a pipeline. It may depend on ownership of the pipeline. Similarly, with respect to the LNG facility itself. So there's a couple of things that you have to remember in terms of whether you use natural gas to produce natural gas slash LNG or whether you use electricity. The one thing that's important about the uh, use of renewable electricity is that we can fix price for 25 to 40 years. It's a major capital investment to produce renewable electricity, but in terms of my operating costs going forward, I'm not looking at any fuel price risk. The fuel price risk is wind or it's water or it's solar or it's geothermal. And unless there's a government tax on that, then that essentially is free. One of the key features right now in terms of looking at whether you use natural gas to produce natural gas is going to be the economic side of it. And what's driving the prospects for LNG in this province right now is the difference in price in North America between natural gas 
And this is a gas price forecast by the province of British Columbia, which is the green line. And the red line, which is the value of LNG landed in a place like Japan or China. What's, what happens in Asia is the price of natural gas is set in relation to its energy equivalent value to a barrel of oil. And this makes perfectly good sense. What you do is you take the price of a barrel of oil and you divide by a factor of six, seven, maybe eight. So in other words, take 100, divide by seven, and you should get the price of natural gas. Well, that's not happening in North America anymore. And when I look at this graph, I find it rather amazing because it assumes that this spread that historically has not been there is going to stay in place for the next 30 or 40 years. And for all the economists in the room, this is the key question that I have is, why is that going to happen? For the capitalists in the room might say, is capitalism about to fail? Because I can use natural gas as a substitute for oil for just about anything I can think of. It's always assumed that all you'd use, for natural, you'd use natural gas for in Asia is for the purposes of electricity generation. No, I can run trucks on LNG. I can run buses on LNG. I can run ships on LNG. Or I can run it on compressed gas. We've been able to do that, at least by my reckoning, since the mid-'80s. I was on a team, I was part of a team of people in the mid-'80s where as part of Expo 86, guess what we were doing? We were getting people to run cars and ferries on natural gas. And at that point in time, the price differential is not anywhere near what it is today. And it's amazing how the same problem has arisen. Nobody wants to convert trucks to run on natural gas because there aren't any fueling stations. There aren't any fueling stations because nobody wants to convert their truck. We faced exactly the same problem in the mid-80s, so what did we do? We came up with a program that encouraged people through financial incentives to convert their trucks, uh, their cars to run on natural gas, and we, it, money was provided to Shell, so it set up five fueling stations in the lower mainland. It was a wildly success, it was a very successful program, but it came to an end because the government then realized, gee, we're not collecting road tax on uh, the natural gas that's being used for transportation, so therefore we'll put on the road tax, and that the gap that then existed disappeared. But this gap is so big right now, um, it's unlikely to disappear anytime soon, and in, in, in addition to that, you have to think in terms of the price of oil. What is the how far down can the price of oil come if there's a lot of substitution of natural gas for oil? So you have to think in terms of the new cost of oil. What's that? A new barrel out of the tar sands? Is it going to be uh, can the price of extracting a, a barrel of oil out of the ground out of a shale formation? And to close this talk off, I just quickly want to go through some of the slides that show you what's been happening in terms of the differential between the price of oil and natural gas. We can go back a long way and you can look at the bottom line and you can see that the, what the historic relationships have been in terms of, remember I said divide by six or seven or eight or sometimes more. Right now we're one to 22. So why should that continue to exist when you're looking at the price of oil relative to natural gas? What does all this mean in relation to what I'm talking about? Why should you use renewable? Because in my view, there's a considerable risk that that gap is going to close. As the price of natural gas moves up, the cost of generating electricity using it is also going to move up. So it's a question of I've got risk associated with using natural gas to generate electricity in terms of price because roughly 60% of the cost of generating electricity is the price of natural gas. In addition to that, I've got the carbon risk now associated with natural gas. Currently, using the carbon tax in British Columbia, we'll have about $11 a megawatt hour is the carbon adder to using natural gas to generate electricity. You can look at additional graphs in terms of the price of oil and natural gas. You can see that starting in 2008, 2009, as they're discovering more natural gas in the United States and Canada through unconventional, we're starting to get this spread. But historically, we haven't had 
that huge a spread. Same thing here. We'll go back to 1986. And then we look at what's happened in terms of the prices in the major markets around the world, in US, Europe, and Japan. And you can see how the US, Canada is, is very low price, whereas Europe and Asia are essentially tracking the price of oil. And the final graph, to really hammer home the point, look what's happened. The price of oil and natural gas are diverged. The question is, why should that carry on? And if you're generating electricity using natural gas, you've got that risk. In addition to that, you now have the carbon risk. And those concludes my, that concludes my opening comments. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. I, I need a quick sip of water before I start. Okay, um, thank you so much to David. Uh, that's a really good setup for my talk and thanks uh, especially to Carbon Talks and to PIX for hosting this. Um, I mean, I thought it was more of a debate but I think we're actually gonna agree on, on, a, on a lot more. Um, I think this is possibly one of the most important issues facing the province uh, right now and I, I think that uh, a more enlightened debate uh, about LNG and energy development in general in the province uh, needs to be front and center uh, as we head into the next election in May. Um, you know, my background is as an economist, not as a lawyer, um, so maybe we complement each other in that respect. But I spent most of the, the past uh, seven years working on climate change and uh, the Climate Justice Project, which tries to um, look at the issues and how we take the science around climate change seriously and transition from a world or a province uh, that's very dependent on fossil fuels to something close to zero fossil fuels uh, by 2040. That's the target that we've taken for ourselves. So in terms of LNG, I'm going to make a more pointed argument than David. Um, the case against LNG to me is that, um, and uh, this is part of the broader natural gas strategy of the provincial government, uh, is that it's immoral, it's illegal, and it's bad economics. Why is it immoral? Um, well, David started with fracking, and I think that's a good place to start. Um, we know that uh, fracking is a very um, destructive environmental technology for accessing oil and gas, in BC's case, uh, natural gas. Uh, it's been known to contaminate water supplies. Uh, it's been shown to cause earthquakes. Uh, there are other leakages uh, associated with, uh, with methane, as David mentioned. Um, that's, I think, one important kind of classic environmental justice uh, argument against natural gas development. But I'm more focused, as you can guess, on, on climate change and the carbon emissions that result from that fracking process and its pipeline to the coast and uh, conversion into LNG and shipping to Asia. Um, you know, we know that climate change is happening. I'm sure everyone in this room is on, on side with that. We know that the principal cause of, of climate change uh, is fossil fuels, extracting carbon from underground and putting it into the atmosphere. Uh, last week, the International Energy Agency came up with a report that said uh, we can burn no more than one-third of the reserves of fossil fuels that we know about um, worldwide and stay under the two degrees uh, warming target that has been established um, for, um, at least for climate negotiations. Uh, a lot of poor countries argue that the target should be one and a half degrees. Uh, some people think we should have uh, more leeway. Some people think that even if we stopped all emissions tomorrow, we would still hit two degrees. So currently we're about uh, just under one degree warmer than pre-industrial times. And already we are seeing the impacts uh, climate-wise in terms of that. Um, I don't have to give the long list to you, but certainly the, this year has been uh, a pivotal one. It's, it, it made its uh, um, un desired uh, entrance into the U.S. election debate because of Hurricane Sandy. But even going back to that, we've seen a series of climate-related disasters uh, in the United States and Canada and other parts of the world. Uh, major drought in the United States this summer, uh, responsible for a loss of about 40 percent 
of the corn crop and other grains as well. So climate change is happening. Uh, it's put the global climate system on steroids and it's leading to droughts, fires, flooding, uh, extreme weather events of all shapes and sizes. Uh, last year in 2011, it was estimated that the insured damages resulting from that worldwide were about $100 billion. And if you count uninsured damages as well, uh, the number goes even higher. So I think it's immoral for the province to hinge its economic strategy on further extraction of fossil fuels and expansion of the infrastructure of fossil fuels. Um, there's a good reason to believe that this is um, not the path we want to be on. Um, these impose huge costs on other people, other parts of the world and down the future. Uh, ec economists call these externalities. These are the costs that are imposed on third parties. So as a consumer, when you buy gas or a producer, you sell gas, there are costs associated with the use of that fuel that are not born in that market transaction. And that's kind of the intuition behind carbon prices overall. I think it's also immoral because we know how to fix it. Aggressive improvements in our energy efficiency of our appliances, of our buildings, of our vehicles. Um, investment in renewables, shifting to clean electric sources of power. The development of more complete communities through better urban planning. All of this will take a few decades to pull off but we can do it, and in particular, we can do it here in BC because we have such a large base of installed hydroelectric power, and we've already made some good first steps along the way. So that brings me to the second point, that the natural gas strategy and LNG development uh, is illegal. Uh, BC's taken some good first steps uh, on climate change uh, in 2008. We brought in a carbon tax. We brought in various regulations. Uh, we are starting to make investments in more dense mixed-use communities. Uh, we've seen reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions by about 4.5% uh, as a result. Uh, from 2007 to 2010, which is the last year for which we have data, um, emissions are down, particularly from transportation and buildings. Uh, now, you can argue that a lot of that is due to the recession and the economy, and probably a lot of it is, but I think a good piece of it is also due to climate action policies and the general conversation we've had in the province around climate change. Um, so in spite of those first steps, um, oh, and sorry, actually what I should add is that um, we've wrapped up those climate actions in a law, uh, the Greenhouse Gas uh, Reduction Targets Law, which mandates a one-third reduction in our GHG levels relative to 2007 levels by 2020 and an 80% reduction by 2050. Um, any way you slice it, the natural gas strategy and the development of these LNG facilities um, blows those targets out of the water. Uh, David already alluded to this in his talk. Um, so I did a paper recently looking at this and did three scenarios of different kind of rollouts of LNG. And essentially what it means is that in the, in the lower, more generous scenarios, it would mean to facilitate the expansion of emissions from the oil and gas industry, uh, it would require that uh, in the low scenario, the rest of the economy reduce its emissions by about two-thirds between now and 2020, and in the middle scenario, by about 80%. That's not very likely to happen. So essentially, we're talking about uh, making it virtually impossible for the rest of the economy, industry, other commercial businesses, uh, households, to reduce their emissions enough to still meet the law and allow the growth of this industry. Um, the other part of it is that, I mean, this is being developed exclusively for export. Uh, of the natural gas production in BC, only about 15% is used for domestic consumption. Uh, the rest of it is currently exported to Alberta and to the United States. Uh, all of the LNG and the, the natural gas and the increase in fracking uh, would be aimed for Asian markets. So the government has argued that, um, well, China is very dependent on coal. If we substitute natural gas, which is a cleaner burning fossil fuel for coal, we actually help global climate change efforts um, by, uh, by the, the, the difference in that. Um, I think that's basically wishful thinking. 
Uh, the International Energy Agency estimates that coal consumption in China is going to continue to grow over the next couple decades. Uh, increasing natural gas exports to China will only pile on and, uh, and make it a worse situation there. The other major market for LNG is Japan. Uh, Japan right now is wrestling with the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and if it replaces its nuclear capacity with LNG, uh, it's only going to lead to a bigger spike in emissions from Japan. So the idea that we are offsetting emissions in other markets and helping climate actions uh, is nothing but wishful thinking. Uh, in fact, if you look at the total amount of fuel that would be extracted from below the ground and put into the atmosphere, we're looking at the equivalent of adding at least 24 million cars to the roads of the world. So finally, the... Uh, the case against LNG is that it's bad economics. Uh, the Premier likes to tout that this is going to be worth a trillion dollars to the, to the economy of British Columbia. That's over 30 years, and it's based on the, the differential in price that David pointed out in his talk. Um, if you look at the, the numbers that they present, and they won't actually allow you to look at the, the modeling itself, um, but I've been able to meet with some of them and talk about it. Um, most of that is just the profit going to companies. Um, very little of it goes into the pockets of the provincial government through royalties uh, or to workers through jobs. Um, in fact, in terms of jobs, um, most of this is a, is a delusion. Um, there's only about 7,000 jobs in the oil and gas industry in BC currently. Uh, it represents about 0.3% of our total employment. Um, if we roll out the, the natural gas strategy as is called for in the, in the plan, um, we're looking at maybe 2,500 jobs maximum. I think that's a very, very generous estimate. I've just taken that from the government. But even if you took that at face value, that represents about 0.1% of BC's employment. So in exchange for fairly massive environmental destruction, we get very, very little uh, jobs in return. Um, in fact, we would actually be much better off if we were to take the same dollar investment and pump it into the things that we know we need, public transit, building retrofits, and so forth. In terms of government revenues, uh, even though uh, production levels are at record highs, uh, we are receiving very, very little public revenue for the resource right now. Uh, in the current budgetary year, it's estimated that uh, natural gas royalties will be about $157 million dollars on a budget of about 40 billion. So 0.3% of the provincial budget are those royalties. Uh, so we are essentially giving away the resource right now, even though it's a finite resource uh, and we could be using it much more strategically. So I think, I mean, the only conditions upon which you would allow natural gas as part of um, a strategy is that you have a firm climate action plan in place uh, and natural gas is a strategic transition fuel uh, for BC, and in fact, I would be open to exporting it to other countries as well if they had uh, similar climate commitments in plan, and it was part of a bona fide international agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But I'm simply not uh, seeing that where I'm at. So, um, final thoughts: um, we're subsidizing this. Uh, we subsidize it through our tax code. We subsidize it by building infrastructure, and we subsidize it by uh, cheap BC hydro rates. Uh, all of the new demand on BC hydro system is coming from large industry, mostly mining and oil and gas. Um, they are paying the industrial transmission rate, which is about a third the cost of acquiring that new power uh, on the market uh, through uh, independent uh, power producer agreements that uh, BC Hydro has signed. So we are providing huge subsidies as a public uh, to this, probably far in excess of what we're getting uh, in terms of royalties back. So uh, my final comment is that I think doing the right thing is actually better for the planet, it's better economics, and it's a vision that we can do. Um, this is not something that is technologically impossible. Um, we know what the parameters are. The main gap is political will. So um, thank you very much for having me. Really look forward to the discussion, and thanks again to everyone, for, uh, to the hosts for putting this on. Thank you.
Okay, so I know we already have a lot of questions in the room. I will ask you to please keep your questions short so we can take as many as possible and please do not let your tempers flare like the natural gas. So who wants the first question? I have somebody up there. might have a great idea, it might be better for the economy, but uh, you need, like you mentioned, the political will. So um, if LNG is moral, as you say, what can you offer to politicians instead as a way to advance our economy? Because you see this a lot right now, even nationally. This is a, like energy exports is an easy route to advance politically. Um, so what can you offer politicians to help them instead? Well, I mean, the way I think about it is that, you know, we need to drive new investment into building the world that we want. Essentially, we need to rebuild a lot of the infrastructure of our, our society. So, uh, like I said, investments in uh, energy efficiency um, dramatically in terms of our buildings, in terms of vehicles, in terms of everything else that we use. I think it's conceivable that we could get four to tenfold improvements uh, in the efficiency. Switching to uh, clean sources of electricity to power that, um, which I think, by and large, we could accommodate a lot of that from the existing BC Hydro capacity if we were willing to look seriously at the, the drain on that demand that's currently coming from the mining and oil and gas uh, sector. Uh, but certainly we would need to electrify transportation as a, as a big piece of it. We would need to build out public transit uh, uh, networks. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so all of that is going to cost a lot of money. I think carbon tax is totally the way to go. Uh, we're already raising more than a billion dollars a year from the current carbon tax, so almost 10 times what we're getting in terms of natural gas royalties. We need to continue to increase the carbon tax. Uh, Mark Jackard and colleagues estimate that it needs to hit about $200 per tonne by 2020. So if we got there and we assumed that uh, BC met its 2020 target, that would still mean a revenue source of almost $8 billion a year. Now, there's some distributional issues you have to figure into that. It's this type of policy, you know, if, if you just do it on the pricing side, would have a very detrimental impact on low and middle income households. So you need to transfer a bunch of that money back to them. But if you took half of the money that you raised, um, you know, you'd be looking at $4 billion a year in investments in what we need. So we need to rapidly build that out. All of that is going to create a lot of jobs, and I think that's the job. That's our goal for the next you know, two to three decades, is to build out this clean energy economy that people actually want, and that allows us to have a viable human civilization on this planet for the long term. Okay, we have two questions from Twitter for Mark. Uh, Mark, wouldn't profits to companies in BC get reinvested in the economy? And second question, royalty revenue is low because natural gas prices are low. If they were higher, wouldn't that lead to higher royalties? So on the royalties, it's true. I mean, if you go back to like 2005, 06, uh, royalties from natural gas were about 1.9 billion. So a lot more than they are today. And that's at much lower production levels. So it is certainly possible to have a royalty regime that does return the benefits to the province. Um, but right now, that's not the case. I mean, essentially, we are giving away uh, the resource, and I think that's uh, un unacceptable for the how you manage uh, a natural resource. And, and sorry, the first question was. And the um, second, uh, first question was, when profits to companies in BC be reinvested in the economy? Uh, maybe, um, and maybe they would be reinvested in building more fossil fuel infrastructure, but maybe they will just be repatriated to uh, wherever those investors uh, are from because there are other market opportunities that are more profitable to them. So I don't think there's any guarantee of that. Other questions? We have one up. Well, my question is real simple. Um, should the carbon tax be revenue neutral? Uh, no. Uh, I, you know, I think the argument for the carbon tax was that you know, if you brought in corporate and personal income tax cuts, that these would have a beneficial economic impact as well. I don't think that's actually the case empirically in terms of the economics. Um, it's more than just the pricing around carbon that you need to, to, to drive decisions. We need to invest a lot of money into research and innovation, into building the infrastructure we want. You know, even, even if you have a $200 a ton carbon tax, that doesn't manifest itself in public transit systems. You actually need collective action to make that 
that happen. So I think that's a really important part. What you do with the revenues actually matters in some ways more than the carbon price itself. I look at it very differently. I believe that the carbon tax should be revenue neutral because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to change their behavior. So for the purposes of the LNG industry and the gas industry, I want to start from the very beginning of using electrification and so that I've got an opportunity to have renewable electricity in there. If I do that, given that the natural gas reserves are finite, they're not renewable in any way unless you look at it over a million or two million year horizon, what you have after the natural gas depletes is a renewable supply of electricity just in the same way that we've got a renewable supply of electricity from the large hydro projects that part of the mortgage was paid for by the pulp and paper industry and the, and the lumber industry in this province. So I look at the LNG slash natural gas industry as people who are, are the mortgage helper in the basement or people who will pay part of the mortgage down so that when those natural gas reserves deplete in 25 or 30 years, that renewable energy will still be with us and will supply us with a, a low cost supply of renewable energy that we can then use for some of the things that Mark is talking about. Thank you for your presentations, gentlemen. I'm interested in, in how the LNG plants will be powered. I think that's a key question. Isn't it fairly clear the government's intention, though, when they changed the clean energy definition, which, it was, which is the guiding policy for BC Hydro to maintain 93% clean energy to its suppliers, that natural gas-fired power to supply LNG is now within the clean energy definition? Doesn't that fairly clearly indicate how these things are going to be powered? It does and it doesn't. Because if I'm an LNG developer, I still have my carbon risk to take into account my investment decision. Remembering my investment horizon is going to be 20, actually 32 years. Because the LNG plants probably won't come on for at least seven years. And then an LNG plant is going to last for about 25 years. So I've got to look at this over a 32 year horizon. So I have to look at my carbon risk over the next 32 years, unless the government comes along and does what some people call grandfathering. In other words, whatever you're paying in carbon tax today or whether, whatever offset you purchase today is good for the, the life of your plant, that could be a real problem for the province of British Columbia going forward because the risk is transferred back essentially to taxpayers. So you have to take that into account. And that's why I went through in some detail the price of natural gas going forward. If that price moves up closer to where it's been historically in relation to oil, then my cost of generating electricity has now risen. To answer your question, the government changed the definition in terms of clean energy for the purposes of natural gas, but it hasn't changed. And they can do that by what's called order and council, which is just cabinet signing piece of paper, but they didn't change the targets in the Clean Energy Act. So this is what we're all sort of wondering. Fine, you said to the LNG industry, you can use natural gas, you can use natural gas generated electricity, or you can use renewable electricity, but we still have these fixed targets. So what happens next? I think we had another question. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, the risk in, to public health and the environment, about natural gas fracking and um, the extraction, but then also uh, the liquefaction of, of natural gas about liability and who will be responsible for something should it go wrong? Maybe I can answer the first one, which is in terms of the LNG and liquefaction of natural gas. Uh, what could go wrong is that in worst possible case, which is what lawyers always think about, is the whole plant could blow up. And so that's just going to be an insured liability. Can, can industry take out enough insurance? Well, given that these LNG facilities are essentially going to be in fairly remote locations, I think it can ensure for that type of risk. If they were built in downtown Vancouver, that would be a whole other story. Hi. Um, if I identify myself, Rudy North, anyhow. Um, I'm a businessman, but not really a businessman because I'm an investment manager, and somehow that isn't real, I think. But... Uh, I'm reasonably good at it. I understand all your arguments, both of you. Uh, I am also an environment, 
environmentalists, quite committed, which is also a bit of a strange break in personality. But uh, my question is very naive, and it's basically to both of you, but with the one little exception of disagreeing whether the carbon tax should be uh, revenue neutral or not, you both basically agree with each other on all the points, or am I not listening well? And I think most people in this room agree with most of the points both of you have made. So the question is, what is it that our governments don't get in this question? I mean, they appear to be doing a completely irrational thing. I think I know from investments, it's the old tug of war between short-term and long-term thinking, but what is it? I mean, why? And are you ever going to get through to them? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge question in North America, BC, worldwide. Um, my sense is that politicians, by and large, view climate action as a dog. That it's assumed that by, um, you know, taking on this, you know, challenge that confronts our generation, that somehow this will be um, bad for the economy. And certainly for the, um, you know, fossil fuel industries, which we need to, you know, to phase out, not ramp up, um, it would actually be a negative. But I think that there are huge economic benefits to be had in other areas. Uh, I think it allows politicians to talk about the, a, a frame of, of leadership and uh, meeting the challenges of, of our generation. Uh, so I, I'm kind of puzzled by that as well. I mean, obviously, to some extent, there are certain parties that are more allied with those vested interests, and that, you know, is a, uh, is a huge barrier. What I would like to see is a, a gentleman's agreement between all political parties that says, uh, we are going to recommit to the law of the land, BC's GHG Targets Act, and let's have a wide-ranging debate about how we get to those targets, and everything can be on the table. But that's the debate we need to have, not about whether we pursue LNG or not, or whether we pursue the Enbridge pipeline or the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Uh, it's got to be front and center about you know, recognizing the, the, the challenge that we faced. And I think politicians need to see some bodies out in the streets uh, so that they know there's a political price to be paid by uh, continuing to ignore. And I think the media are also culpable as well. I mean, I constantly read articles in the Globe and Mail and Vancouver Sun about the latest shale gas play or the dynamics of the pipeline industries never mention climate change. Uh, this has got to change. I don't think we're in as much agreement as you think. Um, <laughs> probably because I'm too polite to start talking about electricity pricing policy in this province and a whole number of other things that Mark touched on his topic. <coughs> My basic thesis is if you're going to take it out of the ground, do it the best possible way you can, taking into account two main risks, the carbon risk and the natural gas price risk relative to oil. I fully appreciate that you're going to have to use some natural gas to produce natural gas in this province, but I'm saying look at the case for using as much renewable electricity as you possibly can. I just look at it, as I said in the opening to my talk, which is, the governments of all political stripes have essentially spent the revenue in their minds. So my job as somebody who works in, in industry on what I would call an applied basis or a, a non-academic basis is to look at that and based on my experience and say, look, there's a few things that you can look at here. In terms of how we go about doing this, if we're only having one or two LNG plants, as, as originally proposed, the Heisel plant and the Apache plant in Kitimat, we could more or less muddle through. It wouldn't have enormous impact. But now that we're looking at four, possibly five very large plants, plus the resulting development up in the shale gas fields, you have to do a modicum of planning. And I've, I've, as I've explained in other forums, I'm not the planner of the world. I, it's not analysis by paralysis. but you have to do a modicum of planning so that you actually are able to maximize the return on the provincial asset being the natural gas. I'll give you an example. Let's take the Kitimat Airshed. Well, 
I have to look at what that receiving capacity of the Kitimat airshed is in terms of air emissions. If I don't do that calculation up front, then if I allow an LNG plant in there that uses natural gas to produce natural gas, I am, may have taken up, for example, half the Kitimat airshed. So instead of maybe getting three terminals in the LNG terminals in the Kitimat airshed, I maybe only get one or two. So this is where you, you can't just say to the industry, make whatever choice you want, and you, we the government will live with that. The government is the owner of the Kitimat airshed. The government is the owner of the natural gas reserves. It will obtain royalties from those natural gas reserves. I'm not saying leave the natural gas in the ground. That's not my decision. That's the government's decision. If the government wants to do it, let's try and find the most practical and cost-effective way of, of developing this industry with the least amount of long-term damage. Okay, I know we have at least three more questions in the room, so if you don't mind, we're going to group the questions. I'll let the three people take their questions if you want to write them down, and we'll try and answer them at the same time. So uh, my question is probably not going to help then. Um, I'm not going to let David off that easily. Um, <laughs> and not talking about his favorite subject, but I would be very interested to hear what Mark has to say. I mean, one of the major issues in the province is the price of electricity. It's not realistic going forward if you look around the world. Um, if you look around the world at other hydro jurisdictions as well. Um, I'd be very interested in a little bit more on the politics of what this present government is doing on electricity rates. And more interestingly, what can we do with educating the public on the way forward on electricity rates and electrification of the transportation system, the LNG system, <laughs> everything, because at three and a half cents industrial, seven and a half cents residential, we're not going to get there. Thank you. Okay, keep that question in mind. Two more coming. Hi, my name is Shauna, and I uh, am the ED of Carbon Talks. And the reason, one of the reasons that we wanted to host this is because so, much, so many of us are hearing about LNG all the time, and by very bright, smart people who are proponents of it. I haven't heard a strong case yet in favor of LNG in the room, and so I'm, I'm asking those in the room who may feel comfortable making a strong case as well to put that forward so that we have more to chew on here. I, I hear the critique very clearly, and I'd like to also hear the other side as well. Third question. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Jim Cooney. I'm an adjunct professor at SFU here. Um, what I hear from companies looking at developing LNG plants is that the renewable power option uh, is a, a marginal contributory at best to the overall power needs. And that renewable power does not come without um, its own environmental impacts, perhaps not carbon impacts, but there are wildlife impacts from windmills, um, both in the air and on the ground. There's fisheries impacts from run river uh, generating plants. And so, and, and there's a second concern, which is that the renewable power generated generally fluctuates and constant uh, supply of power is necessary for these plants. So uh, renewable power, a fraction, perhaps, uh, on the margin, but it cannot be really a significant contributor to the stable, very large power demands of these LNG plants, which is in the range of uh, 1,200 to 1,500 megawatts. So I understand that. I think I have that right. But the second more serious question is, with respect to um, the overall energy strategy, I don't hear anybody talking about why um, BC natural gas, for example, is not being considered to uh, get rid of the thermal power generating plants in Alberta. I mean, there would be a perfect combination. I'm sure the thermal coal producers would not be happy with that combination, but it would be a significant contribution to, uh, to offsetting uh, uh, emissions uh, affecting climate change in this part of the country anyway, in the western part of the country. Uh, and, and similarly, nobody seems to be talking about uh, the difference between Site C and using natural gas in terms of overall um, climate change impacts. So what I'm suggesting is, is that both at the micro level with respect to LNG plants, but also at the macro level, we need a much more sophisticated dialogue with respect to overall energy strategy. And I don't hear either party talking about launching a, 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 an energy strategy dialogue that would include Alberta. 
Um, okay, well, maybe I'll try to take on the electricity-related comments um, together. Uh, like, uh, you know, I've looked pretty closely at this, and, and John Calvert and I published uh, a paper back in June uh, looking at clean energy conservation uh, options for, for BC and trying to, uh, to me, BC Hydro is potentially the centerpiece of the climate action plan that we need because of its large installed um, renewable base. And it needs to be a, a key player in how we move forward. Um, right now, what's happening is that you know, if you look forward, residential demand is basically flat. Commercial demand, so you know, uh, stores and offices, basically flat. All of the new growth is coming from the industrial side of the of the equation, which is about you know currently about a third of the total demand, um, and that's so that's where it's growing: mining and oil and gas. Um, they pay low rates on that industrial power rates. But the cost of BC Hydro acquiring that new power, and it has been buying uh, renewable power from uh, independent power producers, but it's expensive. So in effect, we are providing uh, anywhere from a 60 to $80 per megawatt hour subsidy to those industries, the most uh, polluting, dirtiest industries uh, in the province. If we go ahead with LNG, the sheer power demands to, um, to make those LNG compression stations work um, is massive. I mean, it's actually much more than we would generate if we built the Site C dam. So if we are going to uh, have policy around LNG plants, they have to pay their own way. I and mean, we can't have any public subsidies going into this, including through uh, BC Hydro. Um, and I think that kind of connects the dots somewhat across all of the, the, the different energy, climate, electricity issues facing the province that I think should be front and center uh, in the lead up to the next election campaign. It's about uh, Site C and whether we build that and why. If we're building Site C only to power fracking in the northeast, um, then we're taking green power and we're using it to uh, underwrite and subsidize uh, dirty power. Um, I'm content to think about uh, using our existing natural gas reserves and exporting them to the United States or Alberta or even China if there was a guarantee that this was going to be displacing coal-fired production. But I don't see any kind of international agreement or context uh, to make that happen. But certainly we need to be thinking about the broad environmental impacts, the climate impacts, uh, energy security and our own transition to a zero fossil fuel economy. That's the conversation that we need to have. I think there's a lot of paths that we can take to get there, um, but that is the, the debate that I want to have over the next six months. Maybe I could quickly respond to that. In terms of the question that was asked over here, why are you doing LNG? If you go back to The reason you're doing LNG is you can make some money. The differential between the price of natural gas and oil allows you to make money, and that's why they're doing it. It's just the capitalist system. If you want to get into levels of philosophy, you can, but that's why you're doing it. There's an economic opportunity there. But you've also pointed out that that there is volatility in that price. Absolutely. But right now, there's people who are willing to commit tens of billions of dollars on the basis of that gap, and they can make some money. Also in Asia, if I'm importing oil from the Middle East, if I can import LNG from a secure, stable environment such as British Columbia or Australia, it's a hedge against the volatility of my imports of oil from the Middle East because I can use that oil for just about anything, uh, that natural gas for anything that I can use the oil for. In terms of electricity pricing, what isn't commonly known is that anything over 150 megawatts in load in terms of British BC Hydro's customers is not served at the current industrial tariff. It's a negotiable rate. So that way, BC Hydro gets to recover what's called the marginal cost of the price of new electricity. In terms of electricity prices in this province, we've always done it on the basis of average cost. If somebody wants, and I've heard this argument for close to 30 years on why we should be doing it on the price of the new cost of new generation, that would make sure that people would use less electricity. Then you get into how elastic is the demand for electricity. If I double the price, are people going to use a lot less electricity or are they going to use it more wisely? 
I look at the example of what's happened to the price of gasoline over the years. I don't see anybody changing their driving habits, even though the price of gasoline on real terms has gone up. It could be that ultimately that's where you want to go, but so far on a practical level, I haven't seen that happen. In addition to that, the price of electricity in this province is going up, not because of those additional contracts for supply that are at the marginal cost. It's because of the amount of money that's going to have to be pumped back into BC Hydro's existing assets. They're 30 and 40 years old. Approximately two billion a year is being put back into that system. We're all going to have to pay for it. We paid for it when it's brand new. It's the straw house, stick house, brick house uh, analogy. And we own a brick house. We built a brick house. Now we have to refurbish <coughs> the brick house. Costs a lot of money. Once we get it up and going and refurbish it, then we'll have more or less stable rates for a longer for a long period of time. But it costs a lot of money to refurbish brick houses. I think we'll take one last question before we close. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the study by how we're at Columbia, which said that the carbon impact of shale when it's uh, retrieved by fracking is the same as coal, and how that um, affects the argument for natural gas as displacement. And I'm also curious about, um, David refers cryptically to carbon risks. And I'd like to hear how you describe those risks. So in terms of the, the Howarth study, I think is raises some very important alarms about the process of fracking and leakages of methane, uh, what are known as fugitive emissions. Now, there are, there are leakages all throughout the system, from the fracking to the pipelines to the LNG plants. Um, basically, on a life cycle basis, if you have more than about 3.2% leakage, then that wipes out any equivalency with coal in terms of GHG emissions. Now, the Howard study found a range, um, and they, you know, I think it's a very well argued paper uh, based on, um, you know, estimates in the United States um, that is above that range, anywhere from four to seven percent leakage. That's been questioned vigorously by the industry. Um, there was some uh, a report by the 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 NOAA, the uh, National was it Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States, which uh, empirically found uh, corroborated the Howarth numbers. That said, we don't know in BC you know, what the, the methane leakage rates are. Um, I think it's, we need independent research out in the field that gives us a better handle on this. And we need some very stringent requirements and regulations around fugitive emissions for the, for the industry and application of the carbon tax uh, to those uh, emissions if we are going to go ahead uh, with this at all. I'll just answer what I'm talking about carbon risk. If I'm making an investment decision today, whether it's in terms of using natural gas to generate electricity, say for example, if BC Hydro is making that investment decision, or an LNG developer is saying, I'm going to use natural gas to produce LNG. I've got an investment decision that's going to span at least 32 years or 25 years, pick a number. Today, carbon is priced using the BC carbon tax at a very low rate. Is it changing behavior or people avoiding making decisions uh, on the basis of the cost of carbon? No, they're not. So that tells me over time that that price of carbon that I have to pay to admit it into the environment has to go up. That's my carbon risk. So I go back to what I said earlier. If today it's priced at $30 a ton, and if you use a number like Mark Jackard is using and saying it's got to go to $200 a ton, if I've made that investment decision today on the basis of $30, and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but over time it moves up to $200 a ton, I am going to be suffering a huge amount of money coming out of my bottom line because I am going to have to be paying a carbon tax. 
I'll use the example right now of let's suppose I'm doing approximately 1,500 megawatts of natural gas fired generation. I will be paying carbon tax in excess of $120 million a year based on the, today's current price of carbon of $30 a ton. So if that moves up, doubles or triples, you can see that if it triples, then I'm going to be paying close to $400 million a year on carbon tax on that natural gas that I'm using to produce electricity. That's my risk. And anybody who makes long-term investment decisions, I'm not the person, person that does this, but my clients do, they're aware of that. And then more importantly, the people that lend them money are even more aware of that because they want their money back. And they're looking at repayment uh, plans or, or years in terms of paying down your mortgage of just like anybody else, say 25 years. So that all has to be taken into account. Well, I would like to thank our two speakers for coming today and thank you all for coming. And we can continue this conversation about LNG on our website at www.carbontalks.ca. And thank you again to PIX and to North Grove Foundation for allowing us to bring these talks to you. Have a great day, everyone.